Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our webinar this evening. Before we start, MHPN would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands, uh, seas and waterways across Australia on which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay our respects to the elders past, present, um, and uh, for the memories, the traditions, the cultures and the hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. So my name's Steve Trumbull and I'll be facilitating tonight's webinar. I'm uh, on the lands of the Wadungarung people down on the surf coast of Victoria. Uh, and I'm a GP by training, but I've been involved in medical education for way too many years. This is the fourth webinar in the series that have been presented on behalf of Comcare. It's been a fabulous series. Uh, the other webinars are in the MHPN webinar library. If you've missed any of them and want to catch up, there really have been some wonderful evenings. So please do that. Now, we've got a great panel again tonight. Uh, their bios have been circulated with the webinar uh, invitation, but I will just run through uh, and explain who we've got tonight. Um, so firstly, we have Catherine Ketzimer, who's a, a physiotherapist from Queensland. We have Professor Michael Nicholas, who's a psychologist from New South Wales. We have Dr. Irina Hollington, who's a pain specialist and anaesthetist from South Australia. And for those who are expecting Erin O'Donnell, we don't have Erin O'Donnell, but we do have uh, Melanie Janssen uh, from uh, Australia Post, where she's the head of rehabilitation. Unfortunately, Erin couldn't make it at the last moment, so Melanie has thrust herself in, which is fantastic. So welcome, everybody. Now, just to meet each of you very briefly, Catherine, let's start with you. Physiotherapy, my daughter's a physio, so I'm asking this with a vested interest. Why is it important to send patients to a pain physiotherapist compared to a physio who doesn't practice particularly in the area of pain? Uh, thanks, Steve. Yeah, it, it's not sort of well known throughout the community that there is actually a difference between a pain physio and other physiotherapists. The main difference is that we would use what we call a psychologically informed management plan. So looking a little bit more at that whole biopsychosocial model um, and looking at the environment in which people are working, we don't tend to do as much hands-on therapy. We will still do a lot of rehab, but much more working in the sphere of education and pain management in that way. So not as much manipulation as in, I guess, helping people find their own solutions. Great. That's right. Yeah, definitely more about self-management, almost sort of um, coaching them through what they need to do to help themselves. Perfect. All right, great. Thanks for that. So now, Michael, um, you're involved in university in various training courses. I'm just wondering, in those training courses, what's the most common myth about pain medicine that you bust with health professionals who you're teaching? I think uh, we can't hear you. I've got my, yeah. <laughs> One of the most common is uh, uh, people um, treating or believing chronic pain is the same as acute pain. And uh, therefore, they keep trying to you know, kill the pain and attack the pain as the, as the target. Uh, when our treatments don't really work very well for relieving pain when it's chronic, but what we've got to move to is improving function when pain is chronic. Um, and it's that's a big mistake people make, and that's where you get over medication, over reliance on passive treatments. Um, they're actually aiming at the wrong goal or wrong target. They, they need to look at how can people function despite their pain. That's really important, Michael. That's actually been a very common question people have been asking in the lead up to the webinar about what role pain plays in telling us what's going on with the person and their mm. condition. And I guess if mm. we're just blunting it with opiates. Uh, we're basically removing that form of communication. Looking forward to hearing much more about that. That's great. Thank you. Now, Arena, a pain specialist and an ethodist, and you've done a lot of your training, oh, some years ago now, I guess, in Germany and Switzerland. What's the major difference between the way you approach pain management in those countries compared to here in Australia? Well, some things are the same. Uh some things are different. So I guess they've got a different funding model in Switzerland and Germany where um, many uh, payers would be a combination of Medicare and return to work system. So if we look at Australia Post, they probably would have their own Medicare system. 
Uh, the other thing that's really important is culture matters. So, you know, you need to pick up people in their belief system. And the Germans have traditionally a really long um, in integrative medicine approach with um, homeopathy and acupuncture playing a big role. And they've also got a much higher emphasis on rehabilitation than we would fund through the Medicare system. And I just need to ask very quickly, Germans seem to have a lot of words for very unique things, everything with words <laughs> on the end. Are German-speaking people a whole lot better at describing their pain symptoms than those of us that speak English? Oh, no, I don't think so. I think it's just a cultural thing that if you put enough nouns together, you can make one really long word out of it, but it doesn't change the meaning. Okay, good to know. Thanks for that. I'll be more comfortable. Um, and um, finally, Melanie. Now, managers are important, obviously, in the prevention and early intervention in a workplace, but who else on the team is important at your particular workplace? Uh, look, you can't go past the the, uh, the worker being at the centre of everything, and I think um, so much of the research in this area speaks to um self-efficacy um, being one of the highest determinants of a successful return to work. So how much control people feel like um, they have over their recovery. So, um, you know, in general, I would say it's crucial to have the GP support, but I think it's really important to be asking the worker who's really important um, within their sphere and including those people um, in the recovery and return to work discussion, because if people feel like they've got some control um, over the process, they're much more likely to have a, a successful outcome. So that might be might be a spouse, um, it could be their manager, it's pretty much always their GP. Um, and obviously I'm super biased that the uh, the workplace rehab provider is a really crucial person in that in that process. Absolutely. All right. Well great to hear there's a team involved. Always works better when there's a team working functionally. So fantastic. Well, it looks like we can hear everybody, which is great. And we've got some really, uh, we've got all, all of you are really uh, well informed for tonight's panel. What's going to happen tonight is that each panellist is going to give a short presentation specific to their discipline. And then there'll be questions and answers and discussion amongst the panel, which is where we really get down to the interesting stuff, as well as the presentations from the participants, of course, or from the panellists. Um, I won't go over the learning outcomes tonight. They've been circulated. So hopefully you know what to expect. And these are what we want you to evaluate the webinar on afterwards. So please make sure you're comfortable with that. Um, but uh, just to make sure you understand the aim of what you want to do tonight, it's about chronic pain and uh, also how we can help people with chronic pain to participate in work that benefits their health and well-being. And the rest of the outcomes are there for you to see. Um, I also won't be summarising the case because you've had a chance to read that as well. It's a woman, obviously, with um, fibromyalgia, not caused by her work, but obviously having a big impact on it, as far as we know. Um, so we're going to hear from each of our four experts, uh, five minutes each, and we'll start off with you, Arena Hollington, please. All right. Thank you, Steve. Well, I guess we start with the first slide. I really like this quote from Brown that behind every chronic pain patient is an acute pain patient who wonders what went wrong. And in Emma's case, she's got a history of widespread pain, is single, working away from where she grew up um, and feels quite unsupported. And that whole situation is getting really stressful. Now, it's important. Next slide. It's important to recognize that there is a difference between acute and chronic pain, as Michael Nicholas said right at the start. Uh, comparatively, acute pain is simple and any, everyone knows about this because we all had painful experiences in our life. We usually define it as uh, less than three months and the role of it is that it is an alarm system that helps us to protect tissue from further injury. Uh, it comes with physiological responses that adopt to the environment and to the stimulus that has happened and it sends a response uh, to to the brain um, due to the unpleasant physical and emotional experience. So in a way, it's really simple. When we, um, uh, we, most of us are born with pain sensors and we learn to respond. So a very simple example would be if you look at toddlers, when they start um, walking, they first start running before they learn by falling over and hurting themselves that they need to slow down. And it takes quite a while for them to get used to this uh, adopted behavior um, of movement. 
And so I guess that's the important bit to understand. It has a big relationship with um, our learning and our memory capacity. And hence pain is in that sense really important to progress and go further forward. Now, only the patient knows what this pain feels like because everyone's got different experiences. Next slide, please. Now, taking that is when we say there's a chronic pain trigger that has persisted for a longer part of the time. And in this time, the brain, the different parts of the brain, the emotions, the memory, the learning, uh, the location, what is happening, where and which part of the body, and also the um, uh assessment that comes out of that that's located in the frontal part of our brain uh, that tells us how important is this information makes this a response which not always but if provoked often enough over time can result in pain so a very typical story from acute pain uh, minimizing all those things is when we hear stories of people having massive car accidents and horrendous injuries and being able to pick up their broken limbs and walk quite a while and only when they come to a place of safety and they get care and they realize that they are now safe and then the brain lets the stress response take over and they completely collapse and so in chronic pain, we don't have that feedback mechanism that stops because we get triggers all the time. Next slide, please. Now, out of this is really important that we look into things from a very comprehensive side of things, because if we're only looking for biomedical contributions to pain, so an Emma story, you know, we may be running some blood tests, we may be looking if there's some joint involvement. We completely take out uh, the whole processing part that the pain brain has, which is what's happening um, psychologically, what's happening socially, because we obviously change our life according to the pain experience we're having. And so assessing where people are is a really important part of finding out what is bothering them most, because sometimes the anticipation of not being able to do something makes our performance go down significantly. And that is really stressful. And as we've already established, Emma is in a quite stressful position. Um, so focusing on treating it like acute pain leads to the common side effect that she's experiencing, where she's using a variety of medications to address pain, sleep, and mood. And as a combination of all those things, she has a lot of side effects from the medication and is feeling rather groggy instead of getting um, extra help in how she's managing this at her workplace. And so that's where the Faculty of Pain Medicine, that's the peak body for doctors in Australia that sort of guides how you approach uh, chronic pain management, is really emphasizing to address, uh, the, see the patient as a whole and look at all those things. So that means active listening, finding out what is relevant to Emma. Is it her family? Is it her workplace? Where can we address the social isolation that she clearly seems to be struggling with? And what does she think she'd like to do? Because there's no point telling her to do some movement therapies if she wouldn't want to go into the swimming pool as she's chosen in the end. Um, so it has to be specific. Uh, it's important to listen really carefully to the story and allow people to let things off their chest. And that may take longer than one appointment for many doctors. And it's really important that you sort of take a stepwise approach. There's no point in rushing things. It's taken quite a while for the pain brain to get into that state where um, it doesn't quite know which way to turn. And there is no rush. And equally, there's no rush fixing things quickly. However, it is important to come up with a plan and work together towards achieving a few goals. Next slide. Now, when we think like a detective, it's not just down to a medical practitioner. The whole environment plays a role because there is a um, small contribution to making life for Emma better from a variety of um, positions, as we can see in the case story. Um, and so it's important to sort of reach out to is there is it family in Emma's case, maybe not, but maybe there are friendships, um, build a team of supportive um, doctors, um, psychologists, healthcare professionals, but also um, support staff from work um, and maybe pharmacists around her to make sure that that interprofessional team can re-enhance the message of focusing on what's relevant to Emma and coming up with solutions that feed into each other and augment each other. Next slide. 
So what's important to understand is that chronic pain management is different to acute pain management. It is not just medication, not just procedures and interventions that may play a role in it, but it is only one of five uh, approaches. It's really important to individualize the pain treatment um, and to take the cultural background um, into account. So as we spoke at the start about the differences between my culture of origin and where I'm living now, it's important to use multimodal approaches, and that means um, reaching out and including the other specialists that will talk after me. So physio, psychology, um, pain education are really important. And if we're looking into it, taking medication, it is important to combine a few things at the lower dose rather than using one medication only in a really high dose, because we do know that they augment each other and you reduce side effects. The final thing is that things that affect the ability to process pain and come up with different pathways of managing it um, is not affected by medication. If I struggle with memory and concentration and motivation and I can't keep my eyes open, it's really hard to engage in other therapies and see a way out of this. And so from a medical perspective, I think our role is often to um, build that interest and provide that education and then support with rationalization of medication um, that the right amount of medication is given to the patient but so that they can explore those other treatments that really work towards their goals. Next slide. Okay, I guess the one last thing I want to say is if you find treatment becomes passive and that might well be that it wasn't the communication or it wasn't the goals that the patient found really helpful in this um, consultation. If there is an accumulation of missed appointments, if the medication goes up and the mood gets worse despite all those medication changes, if the pain doesn't get better despite all those medication changes, and if there is additional conflict coming up, that's uh, when we have to be particularly mindful that things aren't going the right way. And we'll have to have that time and careful listening to provide avenues for the right treatment at the right time. Next slide. All right, I'll hand over to Michael. <laughs> Fabulous. So thank you so much, Irina. And you've touched on many things that people were asking about as questions before the webinar. So we'll talk about some of those things uh, later on in the discussion. Thanks for your presentation now. Now, it's um, we're moving on now to uh, hear from Michael, and I guess it's quite likely that the GP would have made a referral, as was in the case, uh, to a psychologist. So thank you for telling us your perspective, Michael. All right. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, firstly, uh, it's important to clarify what the problems are that she has identified or she's concerned about. And there's a, a list here that you could uh, get from, from her accounts. So next slide. Um, and we should also review what, what treatments has she been having so far. And you can see, um, as I mean, said, uh, uh, multimodal treatment is most common for chronic pain conditions. And you could see that she's having having a number of treatments. Um, but what I'd be concerned about is how coordinated are they. So next slide. If we look at the recent guidelines from the US um, about um, managing or helping people to manage chronic pain, these are the key points that they have uh, identified from, and you can get you can download that. Um, this account, as you see, um, is taking an uh, individualized patient-centered approach, so not a one-size-fits-all. It's also uh, focusing on outcomes that are really functional in nature rather than simply trying to reduce pain scores. Uh, quality of life is important because there's no doubt if someone's leading a healthy lifestyle, uh, they'll be much less troubled by their pain. Uh, of course, working um, in this area is not a matter of just doling out a treatment. It's actually working with the person. And we call this collaborative care. So uh, or a therapeutic alliance needs to be established with the patient because they've, got, they've actually got to do the pain management. We don't really do that. It's done by the person in pain. Uh, as I said, a multimodal approach is widely recommended, uh, taking a biopsychosocial model of care, looking at the biological the psychological and social and environmental contributors to, to this person's problems. So that means an assessment along the lines that we've just been 
caring about. And of course, we want to minimize adverse outcomes. Next slide. Now, one way I've found that's quite helpful in confirming with the patient that uh, you've listened to them, you've heard them, is to sort of draw it out on a piece of paper, the sort of uh, experiences they've had. Uh, and the, the linkages uh, that you start to see between a lot of those problems I listed earlier. So uh, the, and often with musculoskeletal pain, there might be some nociceptive mechanisms leading to pain. But uh, over time, there'll be changes in the central nervous system and immune system. And uh, these often manifest through things like uh, uh, sensitization, where positions or movements uh, are felt as painful when they wouldn't normally be painful. Uh, so that those are uh, we've got more contributing to the pain than perhaps where it started. And so we need to think more broadly, uh, as, as Irina said. Uh, and this is really what is happening with chronic pain, um, as far as we understand today. But in turn, in turn, the pain affects activities. People stop doing things. And next slide, please. Um, and uh, they become un unpredictable, what's going to stir up the pain. So people often start to avoid activities in case they're painful. They may develop unhelpful beliefs and worries about what's going on and why can't they fix my pain. The treatments fail uh, or don't deliver what the, uh, the person wa was hoping for. Uh, and this is uh, you know, a recurring letdown. Um, some of the treatments themselves can be taken long term and they as well may well actually have adverse side effects. And that can become a problem too, as we've seen with the problems with things like opioids and benzos. Um, the uh, impact on a person, in this case, Emma, loss of work, financial stress and so on that we, we can see, uh, that's all part of her life. But it's all going on in a context. So next slide. Uh, and so what you see is an impact on physical functioning. Uh, chain, you know, she's going to likely to put on weight because she's not doing as much. And then anything she does do will stir the pain up uh, because of the... Uh, uh, less activities, uh, she's going to start feeling more depressed. She's reporting more sleep. And we know that poor sleep is associated with worse pain, and that gets into a vicious cycle. Lethargy contributes as well. Um, but all these things are linked together. And I think that's the important thing with this sort of diagram with someone like Emma, is just drawing it out from her account. Next slide. But it's also uh, then important to draw it all together because it's all going on in this one person and it's occurring in a context. And I've listed the sort of things we could see in this description of living alone, minimal family support and so on. So it's important to acknowledge those. And once you've done this, you can then check with uh, Emma, have you actually got it right? Is this really what's been happening? And because it's all come from her, that's very likely she will agree. Next slide. So once you've got that agreement, then you can say, well, what might we do about it? And there are a number of options um, that, are, that can target all of those elements. And so rather than just throwing a whole lot of stuff at Emma, what we need to do is uh, work uh, in a selective way, identifying um, things that might help. There might be some exercises, might be relaxation, it might be some medication, some education and so on. But explaining to her where they all fit in, um, why some might be best addressed with a psychologist, other parts by a physiotherapist, and so on, to help uh, Emma make sense of the, the treatment plan. And uh, finally, because it's a chronic problem, it's not, uh, it's not a new problem, uh, we need a maintenance plan, just like you do for other chronic conditions. Um, and so we need to, these are the strategies we can help her with. Um, so this is a way of integrating things in a way that will make sense to Emma and she can take uh, away with her. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, I've been jotting down questions here uh, from what people are already asking, and uh, we are going to cover those when we get there. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, certainly we need to talk a bit more about uh, how to approach the person who has fear of their pain getting worse if they do things. So we'll circle back to that, as they say in the classics. Um, so thank you so much, Michael. And now for the next slide, I think we'll move on to Catherine. Here you go. So a pain physio, and already the question's been asked, Catherine, where do you find pain physios? But we'll we'll talk <laughs> about that. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, there are more and more of us out there. Um, they are sometimes hard to find, though. I, I definitely agree with you on that one. Um, 
from a physiotherapy point of view, the main thing that we find people have a challenge with, with either getting back to or remaining within their workplace is the pain itself. You know, that's central to their experience and that's central to their fears and worries and what they can and can't do. So they're concerned that their pain will get worse or that their pain will stop them from being able to perform. So they're looking at their own task and environment. What kind of tasks do they have? For Emma, it's very much a seated type environment, but she's also going to meetings. And there's things such as the amount of time she needs to spend on those that will be limited by her pain. Unfortunately, once you get into that cycle of reduced activity, like Michael was showing in his formulation, your strength will go down, your fitness goes down, and your actual joint mobility as well. So you become less physically able to do certain things. That then compounds the pain problem even more. You're also looking at expectations. So what does the employee themselves expect? What do they you know, want to be able to do? What would they like to be able to do? And is that realistic? What is the employer expecting from them as well? And then, you know, us as physios, what's our part in this whole picture? What is everyone else thinking, okay, this would be good if we could achieve? And that's where you need that collaborative model so that everyone's on the same page. Uh, one of the things, obviously, a few people have touched on is their fear. And one of the big fears is around the pain itself and them actually worsening it by going back to work. So the degree of self-efficacy and confidence they have can be very challenging when you're looking at helping them with their work. Next slide, thanks. So from our point of view as a physiotherapist, we're obviously in the remit of looking at the more physical elements of the client, um, but we can't look at that in isolation. So you've got to look at the condition that they have, what are the biomedical aspects of that condition, what do they need or want to be able to do as far as activities, participation in not only work but outside activities as well? What are their social things that they enjoy? What's the general environment in which they're working and living? And part of that is the personal factor. So their own internal environment. What's their general health like? What's their psychological and emotional health like? What kind of coping facilities do they have? So there's all of these things that we need to take into account. So as a physio, um, if you focus purely on the physical, you're going to miss a lot and you're not going to achieve what you're aiming to achieve. Next slide, thanks. So some of the things that we really need to look at as physical therapists is what is our knowledge of the job and what they have to do. So sometimes this can involve something like a workplace visit to actually have a look at the environment and look at what they're doing. How can we break the tasks down? How can we give them the appropriate rehabilitation so that we're helping them really achieve their goals from them personally and not just in a very general, you know, go and do these exercises kind of way. Unhelpful beliefs can actually be practitioner beliefs as well as employee or employer beliefs. Things like, I can't do this because it will make my pain worse. And the special strong belief that we really need to work on getting the message is that pain is not harmful to them. And that's that change from the acute pain model into the chronic pain model is that it's okay to do things with some pain, okay? Communication is one of the big things I find when we're looking at either remaining or returning to work, that all members of the team need to be involved in this collaborative model so that basically we're all giving the same messages and everyone is aware of what's happening every step of the way. Um, it's really important that everyone is aware of what the patient's goals are and how we can all contribute to helping them achieve those goals. Lack of engagement can be difficult, and there's many reasons for lack of engagement. I find generally the main one is fear and people's fear around if I do this, you know, will I hurt myself or will they take benefits away or, you know, there's lots and lots of reasons for them to be fearful and that sometimes causes a lack of engagement from the patient. Also from employees, unfortunately, at times, or employers, sorry, at times, is that they may not be willing to make adaptations that are necessary um, or to help the client get back to where they want to be. Obviously then every other aspect of that person and their whole being is important. So their mental health, psychological, social and any other factors can obviously contribute. And as a physical therapist or a physiotherapist, we need to be aware of those 
obviously some of those things are outside of our scope to manage, but our awareness and our contribution to either, you know, asking for help from other people or making sure that they are getting that help from other people, advocating for them, um, is really something that we need to make sure that we address too. Uh, next slide, thanks. So risks and opportunities, of course there are risks with returning to work and that's obviously one of the big things that people are concerned about from both viewpoints, the employee and the employer. What happens if, you know, does the pain get worse? Are they going to cope? Can they do what they need to be able to do? Obviously all of these things can contribute to increased stress, uh, poor sleep and a failed return, okay? However, if these things are managed well, the vast opportunity and health and wellbeing benefits from returning to work are huge. One of the things I find is having routine and purpose is really beneficial to someone. So helping them be themselves and be the best themselves they can be. There's obviously financial reward from being able to work. And then there's all the physical benefits from moving more, being fitter, being stronger, and being able to engage in not only the workplace, but also in their social and, um, you know, whether they have other community things that they're involved in, sports and things like that. So hugely beneficial and the risks will only be there if it's not managed well. Next slide, thanks. So from a physiotherapist's point of view, the main thing firstly is really making sure we get a thorough and holistic assessment. We use um, evidence-based outcome measures, things like the short form Arebro is one I use all the time. And the patient-specific functional scale is also a nice one. It allows them to pick three to five uh, functional tasks and rate that on a scale of zero to 10, how they can do it now. And then that's just used to repeat and review and say, are we on the right track? Are we achieving your goals? We need to make sure that they are attainable and collaborative goals for everyone and that from a physical therapist's point of view, is that we're using psychologically informed management. So from a practical point of view, one of the things we do is a lot of education, and that might be based around pacing. So how much can I do at any one time? Do I need to have a break? Do I need to change tasks? And so on. Problem solving, if this happens, what do I do? So if I'm at work and I'm sitting down and I get pain, what do I do to manage that? And flare-up planning is obviously a big part of that because most people with chronic pain will have flare-ups from time to time. Early return is really important, getting people back into that structure and routine and making sure that any adaptations and adjustments are made. From my point of view, I find task practice really important. So figuring out if they can do things and if not, problem solving through how they can do it differently and still achieve the outcome. Main thing is to give them the tools that they then put in their own toolbox to help themselves so they can independently manage and feel the confidence that they can get back to work or stay at work without needing someone else to hold their hand, although obviously you want to give them that support, but eventually they need to go out and keep looking after themselves. That's it, thank you. Lovely. Thank you so much, Catherine. And I think a few people have mentioned that the uh, video is frozen for them. I think uh, if you're on a crummy connection like me, you might need to refresh if the slides are not uh, advancing. Just refresh and come back and it should uh, pick up from there. So last but by no means least to the employer side of the table. And we're going to hear from Melanie about Australia Post's rehabilitation approach. Thanks, Steve, and um, appreciate the opportunity to speak about this um, from the employer's perspective. Um, probably one of the great things about being the last speaker is um, some of the themes that have come through from all of the speakers um, definitely ring true um, from my perspective. Um, that biopsychosocial holistic approach um, to injury management and recovery is definitely the, the linchpin by which we run our, our rehab program at Australia Post. Um, I guess addressing the specific case study, we've got a few things jumped out at me, some things obviously done really well, 
um, around definitely the employer's response, um, you would say would be gold standard. Um, and from a pain management perspective, um, it looks like all of the right avenues were followed. For me, there was a few things missing where from that biopsychosocial um, response where, you know, we, from an activities of daily living perspective, you know, what, what's important to her, what, what gives her joy and meaning and purpose. Um, we know that she's um, disconnected from family. We know that she's had to move closer to work. And so I think it's really important to look at the whole person um, and not just look at the barriers. It's really easy, particularly in occupational rehabilitation, to really focus on return to work barriers um, and all the things that have gone wrong or can go wrong um, and not focusing in much on, you know, what are those return to work enablers? You know, what motivates someone, what gives them joy to help um, reduce some of the more stressful parts of um, managing a, an injury and, and, and recovery. Um, from Australia Post perspective, we've got an, an in-house uh, rehabilitation model um, and we very much um, believe in the health benefits of good work. Obviously, we're, we're um, medically appropriate. Um, feel free, if you could jump to the next slide, um, I'll just introduce you to a, a study we ran with um, Professor Michael Nicholas, actually, and we looked at um, using that short form Arebro that was just mentioned uh, within sort of seven to 10 days of someone having an injury. And, and the research um, that Michael introduced us to really told us that a score of 48 to 50 or above was indicative of someone who might um, go on to have some mental health challenges as a result of their injury. And so uh, we ran a study for 18 months with Professor Nicholas around looking at putting some match care protocols together um, for people who scored in that high risk range and looking more at those um, biopsychosocial issues that might cause barriers to return to work, but also barriers to recovery. Um, workers' compensation particularly loves to push people down a, a particular medical model, and that's not always um, in their best interest in the long run. Um, we put a few simple things in place. We offered um, counselling right at the beginning of the process, so one session a week for six weeks. And after the first session, we had a case conference. So as everybody else has mentioned, that importance of everybody in the process working together. So uh, the counsellor, the worker, the rehab provider and the doctor would have a meeting with um, together after that first session with the psychologist and put together a match care plan um, that looked at what the barriers were. And what we really tried to do as an employer is not just focus um, solely on what we can do from an employment perspective, um, but look at how we can um, assist with any issues that someone's having as a result of their injury. Um, one example that came up a few months ago, which I really um, particularly liked, was um, we had a, a gentleman from a, a Mediterranean background and he was in his early 60s and he was in um, quite a serious motorbike accident when he was delivering. Um, and he had a shoulder injury that was going to take six to 12 months to, to recover from. Um, his Arebro score was absolutely through the roof, as was his DAS and a few other markers. Um, and he was really struggling with his recovery um, and with the efficacy of his treatment. After that first session with the counsellor when they had the, the case conference, it came up that um, he had a small plot of land with his house and uh, within the next few weeks, he needed to plant um, crops that he planted every year and he gave vegetables to his whole extended family. And that was a really important part of his identity, um, his purpose um, and, and that real sense of family, which was really important to him. Um, and if he sort of missed that deadline, then that's something that he couldn't do that year. And it was actually really distressing for him. Um, and so we decided to pay to get a specialist gardener to come in it cost us about $400. It was a one-day thing and, and we got all of that planted for him. And it was amazing within a week, he was really open to return to work discussions. His um, his anxiety scores came right down. And I think he felt quite heard. Um, and really, it was quite simple for us from a rehab perspective. But it's, I guess, something we wouldn't traditionally have looked at from Mock Rehab. But that importance of really listening and bringing everybody on that journey um, 
and he he went on to you know his his uh, treatment was a lot more effective um all of his scores came down quite significantly so that's what we're really trying to do but really focus at the front end as much as possible so not waiting for things to escalate and get worse and really trying to take a preventative approach um quite quite a simple like that match care process is quite simple and we this 18 month study we ran we found um on average people in the intervention group as opposed to the control had about a 35 percent um improvement in their mental health outcomes they returned to work um to their pre-injury duties 51 days faster than people in our control group um and they had 44 percent reduction in capacity costs and i'm a big believer that if you if you focus on quality rehab at the beginning, you don't actually have to really focus in on your costs because really they'll they'll come quite naturally from there. So um, really that's our approach to rehab now is to you try to identify who's likely to fall into that cohort early on and put a management plan in place um, rather than waiting years down the track um, and then sending them to poor Michael Nicholas and saying, um, he's a pain management referral. We don't know what else to do. <laughs> you're our last. You're our last hope. Um, if you could just go to the the next slide. Um, yep. Yeah, so for this particular um, uh, case study, we're looking at we probably would look at something like an ergonomic assessment. The workplace adjustments um, have been addressed. I do wonder. She, uh, the the worker brings up early on that she thought she might go part time, and then that was a little bit um, uh, glossed over. And the employer said, "Well, if you can work more hours, just work more hours." And I do wonder whether um, that may have been a better outcome. Um, and I think that's something that you would really want to talk through with someone when she says, "I want to go part time." Was that something that might have allowed her, you know, economically, if she could have done it, maybe that would have been a better outcome. Maybe she would have had some time to focus um, on some social interactions, um, you know, doing some hobbies, some things that might have been beneficial from a pain management perspective. Obviously, if she was really distressed by it and couldn't afford it, that would be different. But I think um, that's probably one part of the case study. I thought, well, that might have been something, especially from an employer perspective. Um, you know, just saying not a lot of employers are going to be able to say just work more when you can work more. And if they do, that might be something over time that's not sustainable. So I think um, that's something maybe we could have fleshed out a little bit more. Um, the collaborative return to work. Look, it's been a the theme through um, everybody's presentation today, that importance of um, everybody within the process talking to each other and working together. Um, and for us, coaching and educating line managers is just such a crucial part of the process. Um, it's one thing for rehab to come in and offer lots of support and lots of services, but if you've got a manager who you've worked with for 20 years and they make you feel um, like they're not believed or that you're malingering um, or they're not showing you that care, that's always going to have um, a much more impactful um uh, impact on someone than um, rehab just calling and saying how are you doing so we've got some managers who do it beautifully and there's some managers who need their hand held a little bit to say hey can you just give this person a call not to ask for a medical certificate but just really to ask how they are um, we have a very long tenure at Australia Post we have a lot of people who's worked for us since they were 16 and they get to um, they might get to 60 before they have their first um, injury and a lot of their um, identity is tied up in work. Um, a lot of their friendships are at work. Um, a lot of them live alone. And so um, taking them away from the workplace is actually taking away a lot more than work. It's taking away a lot of support. So um, if people genuinely can't be at work, we try to do things like if the facility has a, you know, a barbecue once a month that someone goes and picks them up and takes them in. So they still feel part of the workplace and, and um have that support network with them because um, we see often quite quickly that people's mental health deteriorates when they um, have extended periods of time away from the workforce. Um, I think I probably hit my five minutes on my Steve. I could go on and on, but I think that's probably me. You've done exceptionally well, Melanie. You know it's always said that using somebody else's PowerPoints is like using somebody else's toothbrush. It does the job, but it's not pleasant. <laughs> So you've, you've done fabulously well. Thank you so much. 
And to pick up on a question that's already come in about your role, do many organisations have a setup like Australia Post with that in-house approach to supporting people? That came from Natalie Bartell. Uh, no, they don't. Uh, I think within co- with the Comcare scheme, um, maybe to a smaller extent, a few people have that sort of dual function rehab case manager, um, return to work provider um, in-house. But yeah, I think we're fairly unique. We've got about 45 in-house providers. Um, and look, the benefit from my perspective is um, they know uh, the physical and psychological requirements backwards of absolutely everything. Um, every role within the business. So our ability to get in there quickly, we don't wait for a claim to be lodged or accepted. Um, We get an incident report through and we we try to manage that from day one. But, yes, it is quite a unique setup. But I think a good one. (laughs) In that case, I'll take it to the rest of the panel. And Marla asked a question early on in the presentations that they found the case study a little bit unrealistic in the gold standard approach that you mentioned. What do others think? Is this an idealistic uh, situation for Emma or have you seen it work this well in real life? Well, I have to say in South Australia, I work quite a bit with Return to Work SA and um, we've done a lot of training with the case managers to exactly emphasise what um, we heard from Melanie earlier that, you, you know, you have to start from day one and you have to listen and find out what is it that they need at this moment in time. So really... Um, you know, act upon before the uh, the baby is tipped out with the bathwater. Um, I think you, it's fair enough to say it is tricky to access all those services. Um, but one of the things that I think um, we're doing better and better is having just general good pain education out there. Um, so in the places I work, when you get referred, you get um, a whole range of uh, publicly available home pages and resources. And often with that, I find that people can start tapping into um, developing the language and the understanding around chronic pain, but also thinking around what they think they need, because it's sometimes really tricky when you haven't had a, a access to a concept uh, such as chronic pain and you come you know with the expectation this is just like acute pain it's really hard to know what do you tell your providers how much do you open up about your other struggles psychologically within the family within the workplace um, because people tend to you know want to filter it a little bit and by having more general resources out there you can start before you see and build your team think about a little bit where do you want to go and i think that's probably one of the most important things we've seen in australia over the last 5 years is just developing more free resources and um having through some of the patient support groups really good stuff available for everyone um that doesn't cost an arm and a leg but that facilitates those first couple of steps well, that's good to know. And you sort of touched on it a little bit there, but there has been a question that I'm very keen to address because it probably was the most frequently asked question as we we're leading into the webinar, which was really about what we do when employers do not seem to be as committed to the workers' recovery or improvement as they might be. What strategies have the panellists found work best in working with employers and we'll talk about the worker as well next but with employers who don't seem to be fully on board it looked like you were going to say something Catherine or were you (laughs) I think one of the things that I found most helpful is going directly to them and talking to them because often we're getting third-party messages via the GP because obviously your, your GP is your central hub in these cases most of these return to work cases um, and the GPs are lovely, don't get me wrong, but um, sometimes that sort of almost like Chinese whispers is like, you know, the messages get lost. Um, so I've quite frequently found that talking directly to them and, in fact, doing a visit, which you know, not everyone can do, but being able to go into the workplace and to work with both the client and the um, either the direct line manager and look at what tasks are needed is really quite helpful for everyone. Mm. Great. What about anybody else? Michael, do you ever thought about that? The person? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, well, as Melanie said, I, um, I worked with her to develop that study. And I think it was quite instructive that um, I didn't go and say, do this, do that. 
I went and sat down with them and said, well, how, how does it work at Australia Post? So I talked to the em employer and representatives and with her team, and we worked out the steps that people go through when they make an injury uh, claim at work um, and looked at, well, what we know is we need to identify those people at risk of uh, delayed recovery or, or uh, long, long periods off work. Um, a lot of people actually get better quite quickly and there's not a problem. Uh, we, I think we have to identify those who are likely to have a problem. And that's what she was referring to by using the screening measure, the OMPSQ uh, that Catherine also uses, that it gives you a heads up on who to, who to really uh, and what sort of issues might be going on with this person. They can then be followed up with the person to clarify. And that's what they did at Australia Post. And they organised, and it's very individual, they organised responses. So that was, uh, I think, instructive. Uh, and another study I did in New South Wales with um, uh, New South Wales Health, uh, with hospital workers, I actually went to each hospital involved and I spent time talking to their senior executives and managers about this uh, approach so that they would support their rehab team, their return to work providers and so on, um, at the workplace. So it wasn't going in once they had a case, because the sort of horses bolted, <laughs> um, uh, but rather to get in early uh, with with an understanding of, of this approach, which is screening and then responding to that screening. And that that's really becoming quite well supported around the world. Um, and uh, Sura in New South Wales is just uh, uh, trying to implement this at the moment as well. Um, but I think you've, you've, you cannot see these workplace injuries as simply injuries. Um, they, they occur in a context um, that it's not fair to expect the employer to know what to do unless they've had some preparation and some discussion on options. Um, yeah. So that's why it needs, um, uh, we could talk about holistic, but holistic means taking the the people, the key people, the key stakeholders in um, the workers' environment uh, into uh, our confidence uh, up front and then working from there. Um, and I th so this is a lot of work. Uh, it's right. the same has got to happen at the insurance end, that the claims managers, they they need a lot of training to follow this because it's a very, it's a terrible job being in a claims uh, office. <laughs> They've got people screaming at you all day. It, uh, and so they've got, I think, a mental health trouble too, but they need to be part of this plan. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the GPs, uh, who are the key, the hub, as we mentioned earlier. So you've got to actually um, uh, take all of these uh, players into account. Um, if you can do it in advance, <laughs> uh, before you have a, an injured worker, uh, you'll find it, it's a, I think it works a lot better. Um, but I'm thinking of the key player too, time. though, uh, in particular, uh, Michael, you were, uh, and I think we had that lovely example from Melanie about uh, helping the elderly uh, Greek man with his um, gardening to get his crop in. Um, exactly. Anything else you found, um, Melanie, that in particular you find is helpful on the other side when maybe uh, a worker is re reluctant to return to work for fear or as uh, as David Elvish mentioned in one of the questions, the stigma of chronic pain and returning to the workplace. What what do you do to make it a more welcoming environment? Look, I think the, the GP is just so crucial in that process. Um, there's a lot of times where we'll work with the GP to um, put together a proposed return to work plan and we always make it, um, you know, we want to set people up for success. So we always make it even a little bit less than we think they can do because we want them to, um, you know, gradually increase. We don't want them to have a stop-start rehab um, process. And where things get a little bit difficult, I think, is where, and, and I think to Catherine's point, it, it's that fear of re-injury or um, sometimes it's when people haven't had a, an injury before um, and they and I think they start to panic often around, especially when they've had the same job for a long time, if I can't do this, then what will I do? And they get a little bit protective Um Sometimes a frustration of ours is, is we'll get that um, agreement from the doctor and then at the 11th hour someone will go back and say to their, usually their family GP, um, I've changed my mind, I don't feel like I can do this and the doctor will have them unfit, really more based on um, the worker's thoughts rather than the functional capacity of the person. So um, I think early case conferences with the doctor um, and sometimes the doctor just needs to see us to see that we genuinely are trying to do the right thing here. You know, we want a safe and sustainable return to work. We're not 
um, pushing for return to work at any cost. And I think once they can get on board with that, um, sometimes there's a role there for them to do a bit of education with the worker around um, even their prognosis, that they're not going to re- re-injure themselves and um, and to just really not have that period of time away from work any longer than it needs to be because we know the longer that is, the harder it is um, to get people back. And we don't really mm. want independent medicals at 50 paces. Like we would rather work with the GP um, and everyone feel like it's, it's not an adversarial process. Oh, gosh, that massive conflict that comes in once you do start getting dueling lawyers, it is so unfortunate, but you do what you can. And actually, Dina Lancaster's picked us up on not having mentioned families at this stage. What's the panellists' view about the role families can play in supporting people? I mean, you might have them in the workplace for eight hours a day or less. What happens in the other 16 hours that people are home with their families? What supports can you offer via family? I think it's the same principle as the workplace, um, that um, uh, it's case by case uh, and what their role is. uh, Emmanuel described the the, the, the uh, older gentleman, his his family situation, and it's clearly very important. Um, uh, Emma is rather distant from her family, so they're not going to attend any sessions. Um, So, uh, but I think it's important where if 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 it's of... uh, if the workers would like, I'm talking about injured workers, would, would like their family involvement or you detect from your assessment, um, they could be getting different messages. Um, of, when it's chronic, often there's a, a history then of irritability, getting angry, uh, frustrated, uh, and people reacting to that and uh, and so on. And often the spouse is actually probably more depressed than the person in, in pain. Um, so definitely that they need a but I think you can't just assume that will be a problem. Again, you need to inquire in that assessment process. Um, and I think uh, Irina, Irina has spelled out the range of things you do need to consider in that assessment. And I think that's really a critical thing in this whole process is that assessment as comprehensive as, as possible. Then doing that formulation to work out what you think is happening, get the agreement of the person and all the players, which could well include family, uh, and then, as but also employer, and then work on this developing a plan uh, where the, they can see where each player fits in, um, and that will be much more coordinated than just firing off all sorts of things at them. <laughs> Arena, do you, yeah, go ahead, Arena. Yeah, I think um, it's really important to sort of see the family as um, potentially the best cheerleaders you can have in your team. Um, And I guess another aspect to it is that we know that when you are feeling unwell and you're stressed, you only hear about 20, 25% of any conversation. So I think one of the other aspects is to have your closest and dearest and the people you trust attend joint appointments or review the situation in regular intervals with you. Um, So whether that means, you know, they ask for a handout from the practitioners or they attend um, meetings together as, as sort of the support person in the background. I think that's that's a really untapped resource we haven't um, really spoken about. Then again, it comes also down to you need to make that journey together in your understanding. If you come with an acute pain um, um, understanding and it isn't improving and you're now three, six months down the track, if no one has sort of clarified that concept of that chronic pain is more than an acute injury um, and that all the other things need to be taken into account to turn that Titanic around. Um, if you if you don't get that teamwork happening, um, particularly at home, then you know it doesn't really matter what we say on the outside. So I think communication is the most important thing and really consistency of messaging. Um, And I really strongly believe that, um, and I had that in one of my slides, there are a few hall markers where we all can see that things are not going well when medication goes up, people don't want to go to appointments, uh, there is conflict, whether it's in the family or with a caseworker or in the workplace. Those are the things where I think, you know, we're already seeing it's not going well. We should then just really see what can we step up and so one of the things I often say is, you know, you might not have 
found the right team yet so extend and there's no point making another appointment with the same gp or the same um physio or same psychologist if it isn't working because the person doesn't attend it might be time to get someone else onto the team and just sort of see you know can we go sideways have we not match this to the understanding and the, the the belief system and the goals of this patient and just um rather than wait until it deteriorates further really make early on a step and review in regular intervals and i think that's where case workers are often um can be a really great resource particularly if they've had some um, introduction to the chronic pain concepts that they can really be good and say okay this isn't working so how about we get that person in I think um, it carries obviously the difficulty with fragmentation of care. And, and that's, again, it comes down to the uh, communication and really having consistency of the same messaging. Right. Thank you very much. And I do want to pick up on a question that came in earlier. And there's also been a further one from Mohan Matala about pain physio. So straight to you, Catherine. Um, what happens? How do we know when it's time when somebody's been using TheraBands for months and not getting any better and things are getting worse. When do we know it's time for somebody to move to a pain physio and where do we find you? Yes, well, sometimes the finding can be quite hard. Um, I know when I talked last time, we were talking about the Australian Physiotherapy Association having a list, but I'm not even sure if that has happened yet. So generally the best way would be via the pain clinics. So talk to your local pain clinic and ask them who they would refer to because they will know who's in the area and who they use. Um, so that's one way of looking about it. Um, otherwise, you know, good old Mr Google is the other way of looking for it as well. Um, but that is limited. Um, sometimes uh, the workers' compensation themselves, they will have people that they are aware of and can pass that on. So, again, it's just talking to people, communication and asking that question. As far as when to refer, um, you know, I've done some work with Michael on early intervention and the earlier you can pick those things up, the better. We're definitely trying to promote amongst physios that they use something like the Arebro as a screening tool, tool and then go into that risk stratification. So how likely is this person to be limited by their beliefs or their fears with their rehabilitation? So um, anyone that works in first contact, I would definitely to say get onto the Arebro and use that. The questions are very informative, even when you pick apart the questions on their own as well. So it's really useful to use a screening tool of some sort. Um, also, you know, a time factor, I guess. If someone is not improving as they should, hopefully physios are using outcome measures. And if those outcome measures are not driving towards the goals and those goals are not being achieved, then it is time to have that conversation. Right. Well, thank you for that. And I'm just wondering very briefly before we start to round up, because the time's just galloped by, um, does anybody have any thoughts about um, ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy? Uh, and is that the gold standard psychological treatment? Or um, a few people have been asking questions about that. We have had other people asking about hypnotherapy, medical marijuana, um, all sorts of things. No. Where does ACT fit, Michael? No, no. Um... ACT is, is actually just a form of cognitive behavioural therapy. Um, I think it's just better to use cognitive behavioural therapy. It makes more sense to most patients. It's got actually better evidence um, and when it's done, uh, weren't done well. Um, so I, I, I think this leaping around from one of these things to another, like cannabis or uh, other, other um, uh, modalities, is, is again chasing symptoms. Uh, and that's the message we're trying to get across, to get away from chasing uh, pain scores, chasing symptoms, and focus on function, improving sleep, improving activities of daily living, and, and returning to, to work in, in, a, in a, a, a graded uh, manner, um, working with the employer to create that environment, and if necessary, uh, engaging and educating the family in how to support. If you do all those things... Um, what you call it doesn't really matter. Uh, uh, the, there, there isn't a magic bullet, uh, and uh, none of those things uh, are going to going to do this. Oh, hypnosis again. It's just relaxation, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so, of course we should all do some relaxation. But you can call it meditation or tai chi. A lot of um, Asian 
patients that they already do Tai Chi. So I would just say, keep doing that. But, but you've got to do other things. But um, some way of calming yourself down uh, through the day is 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 very useful. Um, as, uh, the main thing is to use it. And that's what we have found in our research. It's, uh, uh, it's actually, you've got to do things. You can't just have conversations with people. Uh, they've got to do things. and uh, But so do the people around them. And I think that's what... Uh, Australia Post has demonstrated you create a system that that encourages recovery, uh, then you'll get recovery. All right. Well, thank you to you all so much for those discussions. We will now move to the final phase of the webinar. Don't leave us, people, uh, because this is a really important part where each person just sums up their final thoughts about this topic. And I think we'll start with you, Irina. Okay. Well, I think, um, as you've heard from us, acute and chronic pain are different and chronic pain may need to be managed lifelong. The treatment goal is to focus on quality of life and function and do the things that are important to you. Um, it's not focusing on pain scores. Um, to do that, the patient needs to have the chance to build a team around them um, and to get a really individualised plan related to what they believe and what is important to them, what their cultural background um, um, may propose. And um, part of this should be pain education. So everyone speaks the same language. It should include really good communication between all the team members involved. And it is a variety of therapies, whether they come from a medical physiotherapy or psychological background. Great. Thank you very much indeed. We'll go now to Michael for your two minutes. Oh, two minutes now. <laughs> um, well, I think we can see already that where it's all heading. Um, and what I said earlier, the, the, um, don't start treating before you've assessed what the problem is or the problems are. So I presented you with a list of problems uh, from Emma, and then we try to look with Emma at uh, how those have developed and their likely interactions um, which I, I call a, a formulation of their problems. Um, get a, once the person has, has agreed to that, which, which really shows you've listened to them. And I think that's the first big lesson, is you've got to listen to the person in pain. The, the injured worker um, must feel listened to. If they feel treated as a number uh, and not taken account of, um, then you've lost them. Uh, and it takes a lot of work to get back. So start off by... Uh, treating them with respect and and listen to them and but only but also show you listen to them and that's why that diagram I call a formulation is very helpful because they can take that home with them and show their 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 partner or their spouse uh, what we're doing and it's not about a diagnosis it's about all these things going on but things that we can do something about so that gives them a sense of hope and so that's the next big thing is to show them that there's a there's a reason to hope here because we may not be able to cure their pain, but we can definitely help them gradually increase their level of activity. They can improve their sleep. They can improve their their depression, their uh, frustrations. Um, they can get off unhelpful medication um, and they can get back into doing the things they like to do um, that give their lives meaning. And if we, we work at that level and not medicalize the whole thing, then I think we've got a chance. Um, the evidence is... As Kat said, the earlier you do this, and Melanie showed, if you can do that within a, within a week of the injury, you can make a start, and then you'll avoid a lot of these problems. So prevention really is an option, and it's uh, as there are no cures once pain becomes chronic. Thanks for your input, Michael. Great. Now we'll go to Catherine, your final two minutes. Thank you. Yeah, from a physiotherapy point of view, I think the main thing is to remember that the person, in this case, Emma, doesn't exist in a vacuum. You know, there's, you know, all the rest of their life going on around them. There's all those internal things that we've talked about, um, their psychological and emotional health, as well as their physical health. So we as physios need to make sure that we look at the person holistically and don't just focus in on the physical or the biomedical elements of their care. Um, communication is probably the biggest thing, as everyone else has said, you know, making sure that we as a team that are supporting this person are all talking to each other, we're giving the same messages and that we're consistent in 
uh, making sure we support them and help them get back to what they want to do. I think that thought of the fact that they don't just exist at work, but outside of work, there's so many hours in the day and there's hobbies that they like to do, there's sports, there's activities, there's other important people in their lives and all of that needs to be taken into account and to be helped to get them back to their normal selves. Great. Thank you. Thanks for your input tonight. And we'll finish up yet again with Melanie. Um, yeah, just wholeheartedly support um, everything that's been said before me. I think, um, you know, prevention rather than cure always. The early early intervention we know um, is just so important. And I would, um, for us, we've just tried to take that concept not within the first um, couple of months but within the first couple of days. And, and for us to really um, not focus on rehab or recovery by numbers, like really trying to take that biopsychosocial approach, as, as Catherine just said, of um, how is this impacting the whole person? And uh, I would love to have got the case study a little bit earlier, especially before they moved away from their family and all their social supports to see whether um, there's something we could have done differently there. So for me, the, the key takeaways from what everybody said is, is just that vital importance of early intervention and looking at the person as a whole and trying to work together um, and not in isolation um, to assist people. So um, I think it's all been well covered, but I definitely agree with uh, with all of my fellow panellists. Thanks, Melanie, and thanks again for filling in at short notice. You've been wonderful tonight. Everybody's been wonderful tonight. It's been really informative. I've learned an enormous amount. You've stuck to time, which has been fantastic. Um, just a few things to do before we finish up. Um, I realise I probably should also make an apology. I've been having camera problems and I look like I should be going out to dinner in Canberra tonight. I'm all incredibly red in the face, but uh, I'll try to try to get a fix before the next webinar, I promise. Um, please do complete the exit survey and provide uh, feedback uh, to us so we know what has met your needs, what hasn't. We've probably had more questions tonight than I think any other webinar I've been involved in. There's been lots that have come in. I'm sorry I couldn't get to them all. You can click the banner above or scan the QR code um, that will come up in a moment when we get there. Uh, there it is, um, to go to the Survey Monkey, um, which will be at the end of the webinar as well. If you want to know more about ComCare, then there is a ComCare website that you can go to, um, comcare.gov.au. Uh, URLs are never all that imaginative. It says what it is. So that's where you'll find information about ComCare. The next webinars at MHPN have uh, Identifying and Treating Agoraphobia, which is coming up on Tuesday, the 19th of March, 7.15, and also in the Emerging Mind series, Navigating Cultural Differences. And that actually did come up a few times tonight. We didn't get to it in any great detail, uh, but Culturally Responsive Practice Supporting Families, that's on the 20th of March at 7.15. Uh, please don't forget MHPN's networking program, which supports practitioners to meet and network with others in their local community. Um, there are more than 350 across the country, and the website's there that you can visit to join uh, your, your local group. And if you want to start one up, rip in uh, the emails there that you can um, get in touch and get supported in setting up a, um, a group of your own. Um, before I close tonight, though, Oh, and I do acknowledge we haven't had somebody specifically with lived experience on the panel tonight, but hopefully we have considered uh, the, the importance of that person as being the centre of everything we do. I would like to acknowledge the lived experience of people and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. So please do complete the evaluation for us and thank you to everyone for your participation this evening. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>